Hi, this is Hannah, and you're listening to the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts. You're listening to Root of Conflict, a podcast about violent conflict around the world and the people, societies, and policy issues it affects. In this series, you'll hear from experts and practitioners who conduct research, implement programs, and use data analysis to address some of the most pressing challenges facing our world. Root of Conflict is produced by UC3P in collaboration with the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflict, a research institute housed within the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. What is the history of Kashmir's path to self-determination? In this episode, we speak with Dr. Habza Kontwal, an assistant professor of South Asian history at Lafayette College. We talk about Dr. Kontwal's new book, Colonizing Kashmir, State Building Under Indian Occupation. The book interrogates how Kashmir was made integral to India through a study of the decade-long rule of Bakshi Ghulam Muhammad, the second prime minister of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. We discuss the historical context of the conflict in Kashmir through the book's chapters. Hi, I'm Nishata Karun, a second-year MPP and the editor of Fruit of Conflict. I'm Julia Higgins, also a second-year MPP at Harris and a Pearson Fellow. So Hafsa, could you introduce yourself and your work to us? Sure. Um, So I teach history at Lafayette College. I'm trained as a South Asia historian. I did my PhD at the University of Michigan. Um, And my research is basically on the region of Kashmir. I'm a historian of modern Kashmir. And my work basically looks at how the Indian state managed to entrench its colonial occupation of Kashmir in the time period after the partition of the subcontinent in 1947. Um, So my first book just came out, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. And how has your research evolved over time? So um, I knew that I was interested in the history of Kashmir uh, just because I feel like history is often a very contested landscape when it comes to problematic or, you know, contested places like Kashmir, um, as it is in, in many other cases. And when I was in um, undergrad and even graduate school and I was trying to understand more about Kashmir's history, um, you know, given that I have a personal relationship with the place, I was born there, my family is from there, I felt that the kinds of narratives that I had grown up hearing were not really being articulated or expressed um, in, in the kinds of works that I was reading. And so... I became interested in kind of trying to understand how historical narratives are shaped, how they're formed. Um, And so that's why I was attracted to history as a discipline. And I knew that I wanted to focus on the time period that I did because much of the literature on Kashmir focuses on the partition of and what happened in 1947, uh, primarily from the prism of the two nation states. Um, But and then also in the late 1980s, where there was an armed rebellion against the Indian state. and yet the period in between doesn't really get much attention. So that's what I really wanted to, to focus my, my research on. Thank you so much. So before we dive into the specifics of your book, which we're very excited to do, we wanted to start with a little bit of a primer on Kashmir. Um, so we know that the Kashmiri people have been striving for autonomy and independence for decades, um, and that India's settler colonial project in the state is chronically undercovered in both Western media and academia. So given this, can you provide a high-level overview of the conflict for our audience before we really dive into more details? Yeah. So one of the things that I think is important for people to know is that whenever it comes to situations of conflict, there's always like a prehistory of a place that preceded that conflict. So I do want to I do want to begin with that. Um, Kashmir, uh, you know, in like a pre-colonial, early modern um much earlier periods than the modern ones that we are dealing with today. Um, it has it had its own rich history. It was an independent kingdom uh, led by different rulers uh, for for many centuries, um, and it also had ties ties uh, to so many different parts of the world. Right now, we conceive of Kashmir as being in South Asia, but it had ties to different parts of what we now see as Central Asia, the Middle East, um, East Asia, and so on. So, I really want to situate that this is a Historically, it's a very dynamic region um, with multiple confluences of influence, historical influence, um, which has unfortunately just been whittled down into a territorial dispute between two nations, India and Pakistan. Um, But to kind of just make our conversation a bit easier, uh, the the main issue really begins uh, with partition um, and the 
many um, different princely states that the British uh, left as the British were decolonizing the subcontinent and giving the different regions the option uh, based both on their geography but also their religious composition of which of these two new independent nation states they would join, um, the two being India and Pakistan. And so Kashmir was one of the princely states that um, had an interesting setup where there was a Hindu ruler, a Hindu Maharaja, that ruled over a largely Muslim uh, majority region um, that had been basically cobbled up together during that, that modern period. So the different parts of Kashmir uh, that you know we see as Kashmir today are made up of um, the Kashmir Valley, Jammu, Ladakh, and also the parts that are controlled by Pakistan today um, as are what are called Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan. And so this region uh, basically becomes a point of contestation um, between India and Pakistan at the time of partition. There's a war between the two countries, and uh, India actually takes the issue to the United Nations. And the UN basically called at that time for a plebiscite to be held so that Kashmiris could decide their future between these two countries. And the crux of the issue, as it has emerged in the past seven decades, is that this plebiscite has not been allowed to take place. Um, and instead, particularly in the area that uh, India managed to control, um, there's been a, a long-standing occupation, uh, which turned into an armed rebellion um, and intense militarization in the late 1980s, uh, when Kashmiris basically picked up arms against the Indian government. So Kashmir today is the most militarized zone in the world. Um, there's immense human rights violations that have occurred, especially in the past three decades, which include uh, extrajudicial killings, torture, rapes, um, home demolitions. And since the, um, since the time of Narendra Modi, uh, his second term in office in 2019, um, the region's autonomy, which had been uh, previously promised to uh, Kashmir's previous client regimes, was also removed. And so now Kashmir study scholars and many observers are basically saying that India is really advancing a, a settler colonial project in the region to change the demographics from being a Muslim majority um, into, into the Muslim majority being a minority, basically, and bringing in Indian settlers uh, who can now kind of benefit from, from, from living there and working there and so on. Um, so that's where, where we basically are at today. Thank you. That's incredibly helpful context to start off with. Um, and now, as we said before, we can turn to a few specific ideas that you delve in um, to throughout your book. So to start off, can you give us a bit of background on Bakshi Ghulam Muhammad's state building policies in the context of India's colonial occupation of Kashmir? You know, we're really curious in how this decade long rule laid the groundwork for the events that we see unfolding today in the Indian occupied um, territory, you know, specifically referring to some of the events you just mentioned in terms of um, mm -hmm. occupation and ethnic cleansing of Kashmiri Muslims. Yeah, uh, thanks. So um, I was interested in this time period because as I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of focus, a lot of the focus is on the, the period during partition and then um, after the armed rebellion begins. And these years, these decades that I study in between are often seen as a period of normalcy or when things were fine in Kashmir because there was no kind of outright manifest, manifest violence or militarization that we've been accustomed to seeing in Kashmir in the past, uh, since the, the 1990s. And so, but what was also interesting to me is that um, a client ruler like Bakshi Ghulam Muhammad um, was certainly doing a lot of things in Kashmir in terms of development and uh, promoting progress and empowerment, especially of Kashmiri Muslims, while at the same time taking away their political rights and their right to self-determination. And so I was really interested in this paradox of how does progress and development um, happen in the same context where people's political rights are, are being taken away. And so that kind of led me to this broader argument in the book about how state building, um, basically ways in which the power of the state and the hold that the state has over the subject population through different mediums, whether it's culture or education or economic development, um, that state building itself was used to entrench India's colonial occupation in Kashmir. And part of what it was based on is an idea that Kashmiris were malleable um, in terms of their political aspirations as long as and as long as they could see the benefits of Indian rule, then they would uh, basically decide that them being a part of India was 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 what was meant to happen. Um, and so uh, 
the kinds of policies then that were take, put into place um, at this time um, essentially secured India's rule in Kashmir, but did not emotionally integrate Kashmiris um, into, into thinking that being with India was, was the best option for them. Um, and then, so I kind of follow that trajectory uh, of that story uh, in, that, in the decade that I study. So one of the key chapters in your book is about producing and promoting paradise, which touches on the aspect of tourism, cinema, and the desire for Kashmir. Can you speak a little bit about how these aspects and other kind of propaganda has contributed to the state of Kashmir? Yeah. So part of the state building project is, of course, material and that things are actually being constructed, built, infrastructure, so on. Um, but it's also discursive. And one of the most interesting things that I found is that the kinds of narratives that were emerging about Kashmir at this time um, were really meant to obfuscate that this was a contested site and that you know the people there were, were largely unhappy uh, with Indian rule. And so tourism and film um, emerge as two uh, key sites where, where this kind of discursive propaganda uh, takes place. Um, Kashmir was promoted um, even during British colonial times, but then especially under Indian occupation, as the tourist destination for primarily middle-class Indians uh, from urban centers like Delhi and Bom Bombay to go and travel um, and see the place for themselves. And so I found a lot of like tourism manuals, advertisements that the state Bakshi's government actually published in Indian newspapers from that time, um, promoting Kashmir as the top tourist destination of India. And so it's really interesting then to think about like what does it mean for an occupied territory to be promoted as the top tourist destination? Like what is that meant to signify or what is that meant to promote? Um, and very similarly for film. So many of the uh, films um, in India from 1960s, 1970s were set in Kashmir, where Kashmir was basically projected as a playground, again, for middle class Indians and different kinds of love stories to flourish. And what was interesting is that, you know, the like the identity of Kashmir in particular was um, completely sanitized for for the Indian public. Um, even in terms of the makeup, now this is a, it is a Muslim majority region, but if you watch these films, you would not know that there were Muslims in Kashmir, um, aside from perhaps a handful of um, like servants and people who were really depicted as being backwards and uneducated and so on. So it also gives you a sense of the kind of um, like pastoral ideas that uh, Indians uh, had or were trying to promote about Kashmir and the, the people within, within the region. Um, so I argue in that chapter that both of these worked in tandem to create this desire for the place um, and its landscape within, uh, within these Indian uh, nationalist and colonial imaginaries. And it allowed Indians to basically lay a claim to Kashmir um, and its beauty and its, um, its landscape and so on. And yet at the same time, the people were, were presented as people that needed to be kind of developed. They needed the Indian presence there for them to, to achieve self-fulfillment, which in many ways, as we know from the history of colonization, really replicates a lot of the, the discourses of, of European colonial powers. What would you say are some recent updates on how the state is still exploiting Kashmir through tourism, Bollywood, and other propaganda? Yeah, I mean, the, that project of pac propaganda is in full effect, especially since 2019. Um, the presence of Indian tourists in Kashmir is often depicted by the Indian state as signaling normalcy or that Kashmiris are happy or content under Indian rule. And so there is an immense projection of uh, Indian tourism to Kashmir again. And you can see the ways, especially now with new forms of social media, people posting their pictures in the on the rivers, on the mountains, especially um, when it's snowing, right? And so again, the idea is to cultivate this di desire now for uh, a settler colony, essentially, um, by, by, by having those images. And then similarly, a lot of films are now um, being, again, shot in Kashmir. There was a period of time where, because of the, the manifest violence, um, that filmmakers stayed away for some time. Um, but now they're, they're back. So leading Indian Bollywood actors and actresses are shooting their films in Kashmir. Some TV shows are also shot in Kashmir. Um, you may, I mean, even kind of ones that have an international market, like Masaba Masaba from, um, from Netflix uh, are shot in Kashmir. 
And again, Kashmir then becomes the site where, like, uh, for the fulfillment of different kinds of desires, um, in in some of these movies, but that and shows, but then also again, like this question of um, really hyper nationalistic films about terrorism and border regions, um, which again kind of uh, get brought into the frame um, as well. And so India has to kind of protect Kashmir from all of these enemies, namely Pakistan or Muslims or whoever kind of the enemy of the day might be. Um, so, so yeah, so it's a different kind of uh, Kashmir that emerges than what may have happened in the 1960s. But again, these are all uh, colonial attitudes that have developed over time. So in chapter six of your book, um, you talk about the institutionalization of Kashmiri culture. And in October of 2022, the um, lieutenant governor, Sinha, inaugurated a three-week-long cultural festival, festival called Jashne Kashmir, or New Kashmir, um, and this was basically just to celebrate tradition, culture, and heritage. What is the significance of this decision? Yeah, so um, Jashne Kashmir was actually a festival that Bakshi inaugurated in the 1950s and 60s in Kashmir, um, and it was an attempt to kind of celebrate a Kashmiri culture that seemed to be in line with Kashmir being a part of India. Um, part of what I argue in that chapter is that the cultivation of what constitutes Kashmiri culture was very much um, a strategic move by the state government um, to figure out, okay, which are the aspects of this culture that can work with, you know, having Kashmir be a part of India, and then what also, like, gets completely erased in that in that process. Um, and so, like, creating or developing a cultural identity um, for people should also not be seen as being separate from, um, from like, the political undercurrents that, that inform uh, what that cultural identity uh, is supposed to be. And so with, uh, after 2019, with the, the uh, Sinha and like uh, the creation of like these new initiatives, there's again been this emphasis on defining what Kashmiri cultural identity is. Um, and part of it is to also have these events and to have these festivals, concerts and so on, um, to show to the international community, um, as well as within Kashmir to kind of let people or enforce a sense of normalcy. Um, and I talk about normalcy in the book a lot um, because normalcy, the production of normalcy, it's kind of its, its own colonial game where you just kind of reinforce this idea that this place is normal, that there's no political sentiments that are you know, seeking something else. Um, and things like these cultural festivals uh, really kind of play, play upon that. Um, and they also, you know, erase uh, in some ways, um, like, because these, uh, these cultural formations are not indigenous, right? They're, they're state-imposed. And so they don't have that memory of what, like, indigenous memory might be, which might be memories of resistance and memories of oppression. Um, they kind of sanitize that. And so you can imagine a younger generation that then comes to the fold. They are being, they're basically, um, you know, being removed from from their own histories and what their cultural tradition and heritage is, and that's definitely what the Indian state has been doing in Kashmir, both through its educational and cultural institutions that is promoted, um, and and now that has heightened even further. Um, so you know, there will be maybe you know the fear is that in five, ten, fifteen years. Um, what Kashmiri culture will emerge is going to be completely devoid of what that whole history and legacy um, is. And that's part of how settler colonial states um, act, right? They engage in memoricide. It's not just like a removal of land. I mean, of, of course, it's uh, taking over land, it's uh, replacing people, so on. But it's also about like having particular narratives about history um, and erasing like indigenous histories. Um, and so that's basically where we where we are now. And um, in chapter seven, you talk about state repression, political dissent, and the struggle for self determination. Um, and your book gives us insight into the various kinds of suppression tactics that Kashmiris have been facing as they fight for the right to self determination. Um, so if we just fast forward to today, from India to the United States, far right Indian lobbyists have been doing everything in their power to normalize India's occupation of Kashmir. Um, so what are some few things that the Indian government is currently doing to suppress um, their resistance? Yeah, so there's repression that's happening within Kashmir, which has been ongoing for decades, and there's also trans -rep transnational repression that's been occurring as well. Um, within Kashmir, there's a complete 
clamp down on all forms of political dissent and documentation. So journalists are basically either detained, harassed for covering stories, um, or just made into government like stenographers, just writing whatever like publicity material the government gives them. Um, human rights defenders uh, in Kashmir that really documented, um, especially these past three decades, the, the impact of the occupation on Kashmir's population um, and, were, and were really rigorous in trying to do so, their work has also been curtailed and many of them have are currently in jail. Um, it's a similar situation really f across civil society, charities, universities, schools, mosques, etc. So there's really an attempt to completely clamp down on freedom of expression and make kind of um, just voicing uh, either uh, what's happening in Kashmir or like rejecting India's sovereignty in Kashmir, a criminal act. And so now even contesting India's sovereignty, forget even, you know, turning to arms, but even articulating that makes you, um, makes you a target for anti-terror legislation like the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, what's called UAPA. And so there's these different draconian laws that have carried over from the time of 1947 and onwards. Um, within Kashmir to make it very, very difficult for people to, to, to protest and, and come out um, and express, them, express themselves. In terms of like a transnational context, there's, there's a lot that's happening as well. One of the parallels that I found from the time period that I was looking at with the political dissent that was happening then and the political dissent that is happening now is that any kind of like Kashmiri agency or Kashmiri articulation um, that goes against the Indian state's narrative is depicted as being Pakistan-sponsored. And so Kashmiris can never really have ideas of their own or express them, you know, express their histories. Um, it's always, like, positioned as, as being Pakistan-sponsored, which, again, pushes the frame of this whole topic to an interstate kind of territorial dispute between, um, between India and Pakistan. And so Kashmiris have, in recent years, really tried to contest that um, by creating their own stories and, and telling their own histories, whether it's through scholarship or literature or film. Um, but And so those have been arenas where some of that work has, has happened. Um, but that's, in many ways, been, been targeted as well. Um, in the US, uh, people are afraid, because even if they themselves may not travel regularly to, to Kashmir, um, they're afraid that their activism uh, outside will impact their families within Kashmir. And there's been many, many reports of journalists um, and academics within Kashmir whose passports have been revoked. They've not been allowed to travel if they continue to kind of speak out or write about what's happening. Um, similarly, people from the outside who are trying to go in may not be allowed in, and OIC or kind of overseas um, cards uh, uh, have been have been revoked as well. So there's a whole host of different measures that are in place to kind of ensure fear uh, and censorship amongst uh, amongst the transnational community. Thank you so much. So there is a bit of a timely comparison to be drawn between Palestine and Kashmir that we were hoping to get into a bit. We know, for example, that both regions were annexed and occupied in 1947 and 1948, respectively. What do you make of the parallels between Kashmir and Palestine, not just in terms of each population's suffering at the hands of settler colonialism, but also in the overlapping timelines that mark periods of violence unfolding really at the same time throughout the 20th century? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's definitely resonances between Kashmir and Palestine, um, which Kashmiris have, have certainly identified for, for many, many decades. Um, both are products of British colonial rule and British colonial misadventures, in whether it's in, in, um, in the Middle East or in South Asia, and lines that have been drawn without people's consent or powers that have established sovereignty without people's consent um, in, these, in these territories. So I think that British colonial history and legacy is really significant. Um, I also think there are kind of significant overlaps in terms of the ideologies of both countries and how they rely on religious mythology to lay claim to the land and um, the, the territory. So within kind of um, both, to be honest, like a Hindutva as well as a secular liberal Indian framework, which um, in some ways I kind of critique the kinds of binaries that are made between the two when studying India, uh, because the attitudes about uh, like indigeneity and 
who belongs to a region and who doesn't um, are overlapped amongst both kind of an older like Nehruvian secular uh, perspective as well as as well as Hindu nationalists today. And so, um, of course, we know about the claims that Zionists make about indigeneity to the region and how Palestinians are completely erased from those claims. Um, very similarly with, uh, with the rhetoric that's coming from um, in, in, in Kashmir is that the Muslims of Kashmir are the invaders and that the Hindus are the aborigines or the indigenous people to the region. And so then sovereignty should lay with them. Um, so there's there's that kind of important overlap, I think, uh, that exists as well. And, you know, both groups of people have tried to dissent in different ways, um, including using armed resistance as it emerges with the first intifada and then, of course, in Kashmir as well in the late 1980s um, and early 1990s. And the different mechanisms of control that both governments use and also learn from each other is very similar, too. So things like administrative detention, um, home demolitions, um, the ways in which, you know, informers uh, are kind of pushed out into communities, people are made economically dependent or threatened um, so that the that both states can use them um, to kind of broadly crack down on, on dissent uh, within, within the resistance movements and so on. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of significant overlaps when it comes to all of that. And it's not just coincidental because, as we know, um, a lot of settler colonial entities do actually work together. They share strategies. Um, so when Kashmir's uh, autonomy was revoked, one of the statements that came out from the consulate general in the uh, Indian consulate in New, New York at the time in 2019 was um, him basically saying, look, we have a model that we can use in Kashmir. It's the Israeli model. If they can do it, why can't we as Indians do the same in Kashmir? So um, the kind of material and ideological ties that tie these two settler colonial states um, have shaped how both both uh, you know Palestine and Kashmir have developed over time. Um, but then it's also shaped uh, similar and overlapping and, and important um, cultures of resistance as well. Awesome. So expanding on what you just said, our next question just kind of dives in a little further. Um, so India and Israel share colonial tactics, like you mentioned, um, while receiving constant aid from the United States, whether it's weapons trade, surveillance technology, economic partnerships, American lobbying power, so on and so forth. Um, as they both grow their occupation in Kashmir and Palestine, it's obvious that the oppressors are tied, like you just spoke about, um, do you also believe that the liberation struggle for free Kashmir and free Palestine are tied as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think all of our liberation um, struggles are definitely tied, but the ones in Kashmir and Palestine have, have uh, certain resonances as well. I mean, part of, I mean, there's so many like similar frameworks that they're operating under. I mean, even something like the charge of anti-Semitism that is being leveraged against people who speak out against Israel or against Zionism. Um, now, increasingly, Hindu nationalists are using uh, the term Hindu phobia uh, for people who critique the Indian state. Um, and so, again, these are kind of borrowed um, uh, tactics that are used. And so for people to resist, I mean, first and foremost, I think, especially for those who are on the outside um, in countries like the U.S., which is so heavily invested in both uh, occupations, um, the like to kind of see the linkages where this happens, and I see this happening primarily in two, two places. Well, many, many places, but the ones that I'll talk about today are um, the arms trade complex and the military industrial complex, uh, which both India and Israel benefit from, um, and thinking through ways to disrupt that. Uh, that, you know, to kind of chip away at uh, some of that will help both uh, Palestinians and Kashmiris. And the second is in the tech, um, kind of the tech communities and social media um, and what's what's been happening in terms of the censorship that both advocates of Palestine as well as Kashmir liberation face. Um, so, so absolutely like the kinds of strategies that can be used, you know, may not always be the same, especially because Kashmir does not have as much global recognition today um, that the Palestin uh, Palestinian struggle does. Um, but but there's definitely ways in which pushing back against um, what Israel is doing in Palestine will also impact uh, India's actions in Kashmir. Post-partition, the Kashmir struggle has been going on for almost 70 years now. 
it'll be interesting to know your viewpoint on what the future looks like. We've seen a lot of field mitigation exercises and dialogue to solve the relationship between Kashmir and the Indian state. What can be done better in the emotional and practical sense to make sure the Indian state pays Kashmiri people its dues and they get the rights and respect they deserve? Yeah, um, thanks for, for that question. So, you know, right now, as things stand, um, things are actually quite scary. Um, and part of what the Israel's actions in Gaza have, have also done is that they've emboldened other international actors like the government of India to think about what exactly it can get away with in terms of violence and mayhem um, that, you know, Israel was was able to get away with. And despite so much international censure, despite such a huge, immense uh, amount of outpouring around the world and major capitals around the world, where it's still able um, to to bomb um, to bomb the Gaza Strip and to kill thousands. So, you know, the the fact that this has happened and it's been allowed to happen um, is, is certainly going to shake things up, either where people understand the reality of what's happening or, and work much harder to, to push back against this. Um, or, you know, these, these powers will continue to do this um, in many different, different ways and in different places as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm right now I'm like very scared about how India is emboldened um, by Israel's actions and what it plans to do both um, amongst its own communities with Indian Muslims and other uh, Dalits and other minorities, but then also in the territory, in its occupied territory in Kashmir. Um, but what needs to happen, though, is that, you know, Kashmiris need to be given the space um, to, like, like first of all, be demilitarized, and that's really significant, the military occupation, the presence of uh, over 700,000 Indian soldiers that are there, the immense militarization on the border between uh, the parts of Kashmir that India and Pakistan hold, um, that needs to be that needs to be demilitarized, and Kashmiris need to be able to have uh, their own conversations amongst their own communities about what their future holds and what they what they want to do. Um, and I think there is a potential to see Kashmir as an as a site that can help us think beyond the nation state framework, which has um, you know harmed so many communities around the world. And I think Kashmir is, can be an important site for that. So, you know, of course, people say, well, a plebiscite should happen and either, you know, like, you know, part, part of what I think we can we also need to think beyond at this time is that the solution itself shouldn't create, like, further problems, right? Um, and it shouldn't reinscribe models that we know have not worked. Um, and so how can we use a place like Kashmir to think creatively about how... Um, sovereignty uh, can can change in the moment that we're in, um, and how the international order can also kind of adapt to uh, not just being based on nation states, but like the actual people that live in these in these different places and what their aspirations are. Thank you, Hafsa, for sharing the side of history for our audience. They would take back a deeper understanding of what people of Kashmir are feeling like today, and how the historical and operational tactics used by the state have put them in this situation. Bringing us back to Harris, for our policy students listening to this episode, if there was one paper or book that you would recommend to a young policy student, which one would it be? Oh, gosh. Um, there is There are a lot of good books that have, that have come out, especially in recent years, because there's a new generation of scholars, many of them who are Kashmiris themselves, um, that have you know, that have been published and that have, that have written about their work. Um, there's an edited volume that I would recommend is called Resisting Occupation in Kashmir, and it has different chapters where people talk about the ways in which, um, you know, what the occupational strategies are and also how Kashmiris have resisted it. Um, there's also, for those who are interested in gender, um, sorry, I can't just pick one, but there's an incredible book by um, an anthropologist, Athar Zia, who has written about uh, resisting disappearance. So basically, it's an ethnographic account of women whose husbands largely have been disappeared by the Indian army and how they kind of basically how they survive and how they live after after such tragedies. Um, and there are a number of um, kind of creative works that I would recommend. 
Uh, one is by uh, Malik Sajad. It's called Munu. It's a graphic novel. It talks about basically growing up during a time of immense militarization. Um, that's available. And then finally, um, there's also an, uh, in 2010, when this kind of generation that grew up during the period of the 90s, when it was incredibly militarized, um, there was a massive popular uprising, uh, what many called kind of like a, you know, an intifada um, in Kashmir. And there were a number of young people at the time who were writing primarily for an English audience for the first time in an edited book that was uh, called Until My Freedom Has Come. Um, and so I would recommend that. It's from 2010, but you can really get a sense of how young people at that time were articulating their political realities as well as their aspirations. Um, so, so yeah, there is a lot of work um, that's published. I would also recommend students check out the Kashmir syllabus, um, which is available online. Um, and that also has articles on different topics for people who are interested in exploring this, either from a historical perspective or from the perspective of like human rights and militarization or also environment and climate change because those questions are really significant here as well. Um, so, so yeah, so I think the body of knowledge is has been produced, it's being produced, and I really hope that people engage with it more and more. Thank you. Those books are definitely available online, so we'll be adding them to our carts. Um, in addition to books, for folks who just want to stay updated with what's going on in Kashmir, um, are there any publications or organizations or news media agencies that we can follow? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, there was this culture of writing um, and reporting and documentation, um, which has really been shut down. But if people are able to still access, um, I think the reports by the Jammu Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society, um, the human rights documentation is still largely available. Um, Stand with Kashmir is a diaspora organization um, in the U.S. that has also uh, tried to update people, especially since 2019, um, about the, the latest kind of settler colonial developments that have been happening. Um, Al Jazeera English tries to uh, sometimes cover Kashmir, so that might be one um, more kind of journalistic or media account. Um, and then there's another group of uh, Kashmir scholars called um, K-Scan. Um, that also publishes uh, uh, like kind of updates, periodic updates about what's been happening in the region. And the final um, final organization that I I'll refer to is uh, the Kashmir Law and Justice Project, which I think students, especially here, might be interested in um, to think about like questions of international law, human rights, etc., and how they might apply to Kashmir as well. Thank you so much for giving us so many resources. Um, when it comes to action, what are some ways? students here or just people in general can support Kashmir's liberation struggle? I think education is really important and hosting events that can educate people um, so that they do develop that political understanding um, of, of what's happening in Kashmir. Thinking through Kashmir in other solidarity contexts, so you know there's so many things that are happening in Kashmir that relate to many other issues that you as an individual might be um, you know, might be passionate about whether it's anti-militarism, um, gender-based violence, uh, climate change. Like Kashmir is a site for all of those things. You know, uh, developing and, and being entrenched. So, um, you know, trying to find ways to bring in Kashmir into your into the things that you're already interested in doing or organizing around, um, and then supporting um, Kashmiri organizations um, and. Uh, in the U.S., uh, those that are trying to kind of organize um, as well. And then finally, uh, also looking into um, the ties that your institutions have with the Indian government. I think we've seen how that's really significant for BDS campaigns around Israel and Palestine. And so, you know, India also has immense ties with institutions in the U.S., a lot of business interests, a lot of dis defense, um, you know, contracting that occurs. So trying to like power map what that looks like and see how in your location, in your town, city, university, institution, et cetera, um, how you can kind of untangle uh, those links with the Indian, Indian state. Amazing. Thank you. I think we all learned a lot here today from this conversation, and we hope our audience will feel the same. Maybe just to close out, what is something that you wish we would have asked you in this interview? You know, when it... Um, Sometimes when we think about places like Kashmir and Palestine, we like almost like 
so much of it is like so determined by history and narratives and contesting, um, you know, things that uh, that occur or contesting certain like ideologies, etc. Uh, but I think sometimes people forget that these are people who have tried to live their lives under very very difficult um, circumstances. And so I guess like you know it is important to like understand the humanity of of these places as well and maybe we should be uh, paying a lot more attention to those kinds of um, approaches as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of Root of Conflict featuring Dr. Hafsa Kantwal. This episode was produced and edited by Hannah Balikji and Nishita Karun. Thank you to our interviewers, Julia Higgins and Nishita Karun. Special thanks to UC3P and the Pearson Institute for their continued support of this series. For more information on the Pearson Institute's research and events, visit their website, thepearsoninstitute.org, and follow them on Twitter at Pearson Inst. Inst is spelled I-N-S-T. Thank you.